Okay, as promised in the last episode, here comes more prototype making tips than you can shake a stick at. But before we start, the sharp-eyed amongst you who have watched previous episodes will have spotted that I am without beard. A lot of model making and prototyping involves creating dust when we sand and saw materials. So gentlemen and any bearded ladies watching, masks fit better without the fuzz. Beards grow back, but we're only given one set of lungs. If you buy nothing else, buy good masks, make sure they fit properly and wear them whenever you create dust. There are so many materials available, you can wonder where to start. This is the same when choosing traditional prototyping methods or types of rapid prototyping. A few years ago it was SLA, SLS and FDM, and these days there are so many variations with machines that can print different types of materials that it feels like anything I could say about rapid prototyping will be out of date in six months. I'm old school because when I was in university, rapid prototyping just wasn't available, and I think a good knowledge of traditional prototyping and model making techniques will help you to be a better designer, especially when it comes to form exploration. Shaping something by hand first, feeling and making adjustments as it develops is far better than making shapes in a computer. Designers need to be hands on. Blue foam is one of the traditional materials for early form exploration. If you need a thick piece, but only have thin sheets, you can glue pieces together, but for speed, double-sided sticky tape holds it sufficiently. Just make sure your tape is within the overall size of the object you're making, so that you don't have to cut into the tape as you sculpt. You can sculpt it in the same way as wood, but it can skag if you use knives that have lost their edge, so always use a sharp knife. But remember, with blue foam, there isn't a grain in the same way as wood, so there is much less resistance to your blade and blades can easily slip through it. Watch where your fingers and thumbs are in relation to the blade. Or for thick sections, use a saw, a hacksaw blade or a bread knife. Blue foam marks well with felt pens or biro. You can use tape to mask an area you don't want to sand to give you a clean edge. If you need to fill a mistake, the general rule for all filling on whatever material you're using is that you have to choose a filler that is less hard than the base material. Otherwise, as you sand, you'll remove more of the surrounding softer material than the filler material, and it will look horrible. So always test a scrap piece first. In my test, the wood filler was the best. The car filler and poly filler I had were too hard and caused the sandpaper to skag and remove material from around the filled area. It's difficult to sculpt depressions in blue foam, so for speed you can lightly press shapes into it. It does react to cellulose based sprays, they melt it, as do many glues, so if you want to paint your blue foam, use water based paints, but if you know you want to spray your model for a presentation and you have time to use other materials with better definition, you shouldn't choose blue foam as your base material in the first place. Blue foam dents easily and seems to pick up scratches every time you look at it. So this is a top tip for all model making. If you're holding your model on a desk where there's any grit or dust, as you sand it can move around and pick up scratches. So always rest it on a piece of foam. It's the same when you need to hold a delicate or soft part in a vise and you're worried the vise will scratch or mark the part. You can use offcuts of blue foam, but when I buy pizzas they come on this horrible tray, which currently I can't recycle. It makes excellent soft grips for vice jaws and part rests for sanding. If you've watched a few of my videos, you'll notice I often mention a polypropylene office file. I use them all the time when I need to make washers or cover areas on my prototype that I want to be as frictionless as possible. They are also excellent for prototyping a live hinge. A live hinge is a plastic hinge formed during the moulding process, which is difficult to prototype, although some rapid prototype machines are getting there. You can often cut a live hinge from something and glue or screw it in place, but when using a hardwood like beech, you can drill a hole and cut a slot into it, repeat this for the other side of the hinge, and then insert a strip of polypropylene. For extra security, I hold the polypropylene in place with pegs. You can gently score the polyprop where you want the hinge to bend or leave it unscored if you need the hinge to have a spring in it. 
As well as wooden dowels, I often use cocktail sticks and barbecue skewers. I never throw any broken drill bits away. You can use anything, even old knitting needles. Cocktail sticks and barbecue skewers also help make excellent part stands to use when spraying. Just drill holes the same size as the stick in an old block of wood. Also, I never throw out ice cream sticks and wooden coffee stirrers or chopsticks. They are always useful for applying glue, filling gaps, and for adding details to models. One area I do think it's worth buying quality is with sandpaper. Cheap sandpaper does a poor job and never lasts very long. If the area where you work suffers from damp, keep your sandpaper in a sealable box to allow it to last as long as possible because damp sandpaper is useless. Sanding blocks and sanding tubes are easy to make with double-sided sticky tape, and you can make bespoke shaped ones for getting into difficult areas. I always have a sanding board, which is a piece of sandpaper taped to a nice flat piece of material like plywood. It's important that when sanding flat areas, you sand evenly. Our hands don't apply pressure evenly, so if we sand the whole time holding the piece one way, we can often end up removing more material from one side. Keep rotating the piece, with rough grip paper, try three to five strokes in one direction and then turn it around and keep checking and monitoring what you're doing. Finer grit sandpaper removes less material, so you could do more strokes in between checking. I typically sand in only one direction, pushing away from me, because if I sand away and then pull back towards me, I can rock the part, putting a curve in the surface. Practice and constant checking improves your accuracy. Use all the surface of the sandpaper. Here you can see a distinct line between an area I've used and one I haven't. If I sand between these areas without rotating the piece, the rougher, unused area can remove more material than the area that is no longer as rough, leading again to unevenness. If you can't afford sandpaper, you can finish wood with scrapers. Used properly, a sharp blade will give an excellent finish, but be very careful when using them. You can make better scrapers from old saw blades. If you run a steel along the edge, this gives the scraper a burr, which then removes material from wood. I should have shares in double-sided sticky tape. I use it for everything, but I don't use the stuff you get from art shops. I use carpet tape from a DIY store. It's extra wide and extra sticky and makes my prototyping faster, as I'm not waiting for glue to dry. It's like an extra pair of hands, holding things in place whilst I screw them together. Hot melt glue is also useful for speed when you need to join surfaces fast. When you need to simulate a rubberized grip detail, but you don't have the resins or latex or any other equipment, you can quickly and easily cut up a pencil rubber. These can be sculpted to suit and easily held in place with double-sided sticky tape. Joining dissimilar materials can be tricky. You can search the internet for appropriate adhesives. You can rivet different materials together, but never forget lashing and stitching. It's what our ancestors used to join flint spearheads to a wooden shaft, and when prototyping, it comes in really handy all the time. I always glue my stitching for extra strength. When looking for strong threads and lines, don't forget fishing tackle shops. They sell all sorts of threads, braids, and wires, which can come in very handy. If you're making a visual appearance model from wood, you will need to get all areas clean and smooth. Under a microscope, wood is fibrous, so you need to lock the fibers to sand them, otherwise, when you spray your piece, you can get patches of rough areas. You can use sanding, sealer, spray primer, but most of the time I use gesso because it's cheap and still sands well. Again, watch the dust. Spray paint can be an expensive outlay, so to get the best from your cans, here are a few tips. If you don't have access to a spray booth and you're spraying outside on windy days, you can use a large cardboard box to shelter your model from the wind, or you can make a spray booth from a few sheets of ply. I can wrap this one in clean newspaper each time I spray, and it's quick to put up. Yeah, shake your cans a lot. It's good exercise. Avoid damp. I always check the weather meter to make sure the humidity is low. Avoid dust. 
Don't spray or paint your parts in a dusty area. It's important that the surrounding area is as dust free as the pieces you're spraying. Otherwise, dust can blow onto your model, ruining the finish. Also, before spraying, make sure your model is secure so that it can't get knocked over or touched. There's nothing worse than leaving a model to dry to come back to find someone opened a door and the draft knocked your model over or dust blew onto it. So sometimes it can be advisable to use a clean cardboard box to cover your model. It's always best to spray little and often. Rather than rush it, spray a lot and get paint runs, which costs lots of time in waiting for them to dry to sand back and start all over again. Always turn the can upside down and spray a bit to clear the nozzle when you finish spraying. Once you have a good spray job, if you want a shinier surface, you can coat your model in gloss, or a cheaper technique is to paint on a thin coat of PVA, which dries much faster, but isn't as good a finish. PVA goes on white and dries clear, so as you paint it on, you think you've messed up. Just wait. Don't forget texture. It's not just for grip, but to help you define areas and add interest to your designs. Designs with one molding can only be one color but you can add visual interest by defining areas with texture or smooth, shiny surfaces. In tooling for injection molding, texture is known as spark, and there is a rating for how heavy the texture is. In model making, if you want to create a textured part, one method is to use gesso or another paint on a fine roller and don't sand back. Or you can paint your model in glue and cover in fine dust. Double-sided tape or gluing paper between each part gives just enough distance to suggest a split line. If you have metal parts that you need to polish, then metal polish is good. But if you don't have any, toothpaste and chocolate also contain abrasives and will work. But I don't recommend you waste chocolate. If you don't have a lathe, there are plenty of ways to make wheels, with a jig for a router, a dremel, or on a bandsaw by putting a nail into a board and using it to turn out a disc. On a bandsaw, if you spray the inner guard white, it's easier to see what you're doing in certain light conditions. Jigs are one of the best ways to accurately create multiple wooden parts, and time spent making a good jig will be repaid tenfold in the speed and accuracy of the parts you make. Say I need to drill a hole in the same place on a hundred boards. I can measure and mark each one. I can try taping five together to drill at the same time, or I can make a jig. When you drill through wood, if there's nothing under the wood, then the drill can leave a messy exit hole, which will cost you time to clean up. By making a jig with a sacrificial board underneath, you can ensure all the holes you drill are in exactly the same place and are clean on both sides. The time you invest at the start getting things right saves you much more time at the end. If you need to heat bend small pieces of plastic and you don't have the proper tools, you can bend plastic on a toaster. If you need to bend a thin wooden strip of pine and it's a one-off so there's no point in making a steam box, you can pour boiling water over it from a kettle and hold it in place until it cools. Never throw away old bandsaw blades. Cut them into equal lengths and tape them together to make really good wood rasps. You can tape them onto different formers to change their profiles. As long as you have the space, pens are excellent to hide in prototypes if you need to simulate a push button. And pens contain springs which come in very handy for all sorts of applications. Lots of packaging has textures and repeat patterns that are really useful for model making, particularly raw meat packaging. I use it in all sorts of models, lately for watch straps. You can pick up all sorts of cool things at fishing tackle shops, car boot sales, yard sales and markets, so check these out if there's one in your area. There are also good books available. I can recommend this one, which contains good advice and I think is well laid out. But for loads of model making tips and tricks, YouTube, and the wider internet is your friend. There are loads of excellent YouTubers out there doing amazing things. 
But by far my biggest tip with model making and prototyping is to have patience. How often has the urge to start working on something before the glue has dried or pick something up before the paint has dried spoilt what you're working on and forced you to start all over again, costing you more time? Don't rush things. If you're waiting for glue to dry, plan your time so you're working on something else or glue up or paint in the evening so everything is set and dry and ready to work on again in the morning. Slow down to go faster. Thanks for watching. If you thought this was okay, please give it a thumbs up and please hit subscribe. In the next episode, I'm looking at presentations.